Hey everyone, thank you for tuning in to this conversation about interdependent capitalism. This is a book that was published by several of our friends that we've had on the show before, Dr. Jun Yoon, Jeremy Yoon, and Conrad Yoon, the Yoon Family Foundation. And interdependent capitalism tells a very important story. And we will actually be breaking down some of the notes that we've made throughout the book and why it's really important. And you can find all of the info in the bio below, but I'm just gonna I'm just gonna read what's on the back to give you an idea before we start. The story we're telling is simple. As humans have globalized, family values have not scaled well. Not so many lifetimes ago, we lived in kin tribes where our interests were aligned according to the principles of inclusive fitness. Unfortunately, those principles are maladapted to our modern era, as fake news, fake foods, and fake politicians endemic in our society are catalyzed by the low alignment of interests among strangers. We wrote this book to help the world reimagine new types of social, political, and economic institutions for the global village. The social contract of the future will be based on the principles of inclusive stakeholding and vested interest in the success of others, attributes that were inherent in the inclusive fitness of our prehistoric social systems. The time has come for interdependent capitalism. This is one of the best books I have ever read. Seriously. Okay, let's explore this together. All right, and I have a good camera angle for this so we can make it really easy for us to explore together. All right, so I want to start by just going through some of the main points along the way and uh, we can uh, discuss as we journey through it. I'm gonna do my best to um, get through as much of it as we can so it might be a somewhat longer video, but it's very important as there's a lot of important content in here that I wanna review with you. Okay, so in the prologue, the word, Goyang, Korean for hometown, a sense of tenderness, We took care of each other, largely according to our degree of genetic relatedness, what evolutionary biologists call inclusive fitness. We were fed, informed, and governed by those who had our best interests at heart. Energy increases the entropy of systems. Most humans were once frozen in one geographical space for an entire lifetime. We now bounce all over the globe. Over the millennia, the strong, stable bonds of our kin tribes were replaced with weaker transactional interactions among strangers. The nuclear family has replaced the kin tribe as the integral social institution organized around inclusive fitness. Nuclear families, closely related to each other within the household, live in communities of other nuclear families where the genetic relatedness between households is low. This has fundamentally changed the day-to-day -day calculus of social interactions. In short, our biological evolution has not kept pace with our cultural evolution. Over and over, we expect strangers to act like they are our kin, and over and over, we are disappointed when they do not. These words are really resonant with me, global inclusive fitness. As a species, we have been managing the tension between the social progress that occurs when we live and work in ever larger groups from tribes to villages to towns to cities to nations and ultimately to today's globally interconnected cyberspace. Replacing our lost sense of the ancient ancestral home and tribe with institutional innovations. The empire, the church, the nation, and the corporation are all examples of institutions we have created to replace some or all of the functions of kin tribes. A system of vested interest in others to replace kin-based inclusive fitness as the essential social contract. Kin skin in the game. 
Love this one here too. You can see it at the very bottom here that I wrote it. Kin skin in the game. Love that one too. Okay. This part here. A doctor chooses the most profitable procedure over the one most likely to benefit a patient. A politician betrays the public trust by favoring a well-financed special interest. A corporate board puts its own interests above those of the shareholders and employees. Family values have not scaled well as we have globalized. As you can tell, this is already hitting on some of the most important conversations of our time, if not the most important conversation of our time. It's a very important book, very important. And how we update the code, how we have this discourse and how we update the code. All right, the code of civilization. So, misalignment meets capitalism. In a way, the Kardashians and high fructose corn syrup are really the same phenomenon. The inevitable outcome of a race to the bottom line when misalignment meets capitalism. The time has come for a revolution in our social contract. Unless addressed, this evolutionary lag error between our biological factory settings due to the prehistoric era and the realities of the modern environment will continue to incentivize abusive behaviors. Promote further mutual misappropriation for asymmetric gains. Robots' algorithmic incentives can be designed to mimic the kin altruism of mom. Can we make the algorithmic altruism of mom and embed that into our artificial intelligence systems? It's a very interesting question. Inclusive stakeholding, inclusive fitness, new social DNA. Encoding inclusive stakeholding into the new human social contract, creating new social DNA to mimic the inclusive fitness of our tribal past is a necessity. Imagine entirely new types of social, political, and economic institutions based on inclusive stakeholding, congruent goals, and a vested interest in the success of others. Imagine the possibilities. Can we truly and authentically tie the success of teachers to that of their pupils? Tie the success of health insurance, food, and media companies of any industry to that of customers they serve? Can we tie the success of elected officials to that of their constituents? Find ways to include other stakeholders such as future generations in the environment and those who have no voice. Envisioning the emergence of many models that will enable this inclusive stakeholding. Social algorithms, designing them for inclusive stakeholding that mimic the bio, bio algorithms of inclusive fitness. Again, social algorithms for inclusive stakeholding that mimic the bio algorithms of inclusive fitness. All right, how we got to now? Kin tribe. Five decades of life had gone by in a blink. A thousand years adds up to just 20 of those 50 year blinks. One blink is 50 years. Time goes by so fast. 10,000 years of recorded human history is 20 of those blinks. The span considered in this book is 200 blinks of an eye. So one more time. So one blink is 50 years. Life goes by that fast, five decades of life. A thousand years is 20 of those blinks and 10,000 years of recorded history is 200 blinks. It's very important. Time goes by so fast. Okay. Evolution tends to select altruistic behavior, sometimes even at the expense of one's own welfare when they are associated with a net positive outcome from the perspective of the kin group. A life of service to the global kin group. Hamilton's rule. 
It's a mathematical model behind kin selection. The higher degree of genetic relatedness, the higher the Darwinian payoff for altruistic behaviors. This is why we see that your mother, your father, and your family members, your nuclear family, are much more likely to do commit altruistic behaviors towards one another because that's a high degree of genetic relatedness. There is a higher Darwinian payoff for that. Kin selection predicts the selection of otherwise inexplicable behaviors, such as those that are detrimental to oneself but beneficial to others in our kin group. So this is important, metropolis redesign. Eusocialty, eusocialty is the highest level of organization of animal socialty. Eusocialty is the highest level of organization of animal socialty. Defined by features such as cooperative brood care, overlapping generations living together, and a division into reproductive and non-reproductive groups. Here's an example. Helping the queen give birth to more sisters propagates one's genes more than reproducing oneself. And this is females with what looks like ants, bees, and wasps. Thus, in new social species, the queen and king often do all of the reproducing while the sterile workers organize into a labor force that supports the overall hive. The degrees of cooperation and self-sacrifice among this hymenoptera are remarkable. So there's very interesting biological examples as well to look at here. You social insects account for a disproportionate percentage of the Earth's biomass, up to half in some regions. Social insects are at the ecological center. Interesting. Okay. Kin diaspora and social entropy. A house naturally divides and the divided houses keep dividing. The division, dispersal, and genetic fragmentation of kin tribes are features of social evolution, not bugs. They promote diversity, intergroup competition, and mimetic parallax. That is, the human tendency to see better when offered multiple vantage points. And we're gonna to get to mimetic parallax later and the importance of that. Collisions between tribes with little genetic alignment became more frequent and relative strangers were forced to contend with one another. On the other hand, trading of ideas and goods are also began to flourish. This is with social entropy. Having access to more people can increase the probability of finding better partners in life and in business. Okay. The category of self-dealing, easiest to define includes corruption and treachery, the explicit violation of an oath or vow of duty. This could be a city employee who takes a bribe when awarding a construction contract, thereby prioritizing personal gain over public duty. Or it could be a corporate CEO who invests the company's cash in a cousin-owned business on non-market terms. So we're experiencing this broken code with this increase in self-dealing. And we have to fix it, we have to repair it, update it. All right, these actions are not necessarily aligned with the boss's or the company's best interest because he has an incentive to book a flight that will add to his frequent flyer miles. This is with an employee that is participating in a frequent flyer program but traveling for work. Corporate leaders are accused of enriching themselves at the expense of shareholders. Political leaders are accused of dealing for themselves at the expense of citizens. The problem is endemic everywhere that humans have a duty to others. What old code is manipulating with asymmetries of information? Asymmetries of information introduce one significant vector by which voluntary transactions can be win-lose. Whichever party has the most information has the greatest latitude to cheat. 
with the cigarette industry's campaign of active disinformation that denied the carcinogenic effects of smoking is well known. It is hardly exceptional. Similar tactics employed by big food, big data, and many more, not the least, which is big government. A kind act between relatives promotes inclusive fitness and motivates both the actor and the recipient to expand the pie as a way to drive win-win outcomes. Entirely different type of win-win, vested interest of kin skin in the game. It allows a person to win from an inclusive fitness perspective by virtue of another person's winning. Kin skin in the game incentivizes cooperative behaviors, altruistic behaviors that enabled win-wins were likely far more prevalent in a genetically aligned community than in today's community of strangers. Communities now are largely silos of nuclear families living among other families with whom they share low genetic alignment. And we have this great over-interest over investing in our nuclear children and an under investing in ourselves our communities and the world this helps explain the explosion of helicopter parenting and over investment in children commonly observed today they are so focused on their kids that they might miss a social gathering rather than miss their son's baseball game people are over investing in their kids and under investing in their neighbors Our blood relatives are less likely to self-deal in their interactions with us than kin strangers. As the saying goes, blood is thicker than water. We live over twice as long as our near ancestors did even 200 years ago. We've lost the foundation of our social architecture, kin tribes. So we need to incentivize vested interest in others. Create a system of vested interest in others to replace inclusive fitness as the essential social contract. Right there, right here, we're already talking about the solution. It's difficult to figure out how exactly to do so, but we have already started to identify some of these pressing conversations. And again, all of the links to interdependent capitalism can be found in the bio of this video to both the website, also to the Amazon book link and the Palo Alto Institute link, Jeremy's band, WJM, and Junyun's website as well. Okay, again, one of the most important conversations of our time. This is why we're doing this long form discourse with you about the importance of this book. And even if you don't purchase the book, at least hearing us have a conversation about it here is very important between you and I. We are having this conversation and then you can go and have more of this conversation with people around you. But I highly recommend still actually purchasing the book and having it at home with you as well. Sharing it with people in the physical world too, besides this digital content. All right, chapter three. The stewardship that held tribes together was sur supplanted by the leadership of kings and emperors. Leader was less incentivized to put the interests of the people before his or her own interests. We have created a social fabric codification towards self-dealing. Corruption, oppression, and self-dealing were the rule, not the exception. Tyranny could be maintained over the generations through the codification of nepotism. Ruling over the people instead of on behalf of the people. Developed a system of vested interest in the people commensurate to the inclusive fitness of kin tribes. None of them. And so what we need, inclusive fitness of kin tribes on a global village scale. After centuries of nepotistic leaders who gave the world to their sons, a story of a God who gave his only son to the world offered a powerful antithesis. The story caught on. 
story prompted one of the most unique events in the evolution of human civilizations, the resetting of the calendar. The birth of Christ marked an effective year zero from which to measure all time. Bills of exchange were important, not only because they made it possible for commerce to take place over long distances, which facilitated trade. In the case of a corporation, the brains, the shareholders, may or may not align with the muscles, the company's management and directors. When this alignment doesn't exist, corporate failure is inevitable. Thus, not long after its invention, the corporation became the newest institutional vessel for abuse of the people. The problem was famously framed by Karl Marx, who spoke of the exploitation of a proletarian worker class by the owners of capital who extracted the lion's share of the value produced and left a bare minimum to the workers. Sounds quite familiar. This is why we see median income stagnating while GDP continues to increase in places like the United States. Again, the universal basic assets, the inclusive global village. Organize labor in order to bargain more effectively for an equitable share of the production returns. Okay. New codes for more effective prosperity. The tension between capital and labor goes on. Does not everyone feel that there is an evil at work which needs remedy? Does not the constant occurrence of strikes and the rise of vast and powerful organizations of workmen show that there is some profound unfitness in the present customs of the country to the progress of affairs? If the masters insist on retaining their ancient customs, if they will shroud their prophets in mystery and treat their men as if they were another class of beings whose interests are wholly separate and opposite, I see trouble in the future as in the past. I hope to see the time when workmen will be, to a great extent, their own capitalists. I believe that a movement of workmen towards cooperation in the rising of capital would be anticipated by employers admitting their men to a considerable share of the profits. The corporate mind and muscles are aligned. The effective use of stock options for all employers is a significant element of the mix that made up Silicon Valley and the entrepreneurial juggernaut it has become to help fuel the information age. And there's more we can do to make it even more inclusive stakeholding. The invention and growth of the internet held out the promise of a boundless and inclusive future. Things like digital equity, open source projects, creating a new paradigm for the world of work, horizontal and distributed rather than hierarchical and centralized systems. Silicon Valley companies are now being exposed as the latest institutions that don't serve the public's interests as well as they serve their own. Clickbaiting to maximize profits and misusing consumer data reflect a company over customer philosophy. Again, reflect a company over customer philosophy. Corporations exhibit a grow or die tendency, incentive structures to replace inclusive fitness, inclusive fitness is what we need to develop. Meet the new boss, same as the old boss. Samples demonstrate a recurring theme. Unless first order alignment issues are addressed, solutions to second order problems will only create derivative ones. The central story of mismanaging our transition from the inclusive fitness of the tribal era to modern times. Each of us is both the cause and the victim of the ills we face. We'll get to this more later, the good and the evil in each of us.
the race to the bottom line. We are all responsible for the transition back to inclusive fitness. Race to the bottom line. Chapter four, change that matter most. The evil stepmother effect. Take food for example. Until the modern age, our food was produced and prepared for us by someone who had our best interests at heart, our mothers. Food largely comes from people who care about themselves first and about us second in the modern world. The food industry being a secondary priority is a dangerous position for us to be in. And yet there we are. Make us eat more or to save on the cost despite doubts about the effects on our well-being. Our food system has shifted from being a high alignment system during the kin tribe era to a low alignment system today. Fast forward to the past century where the vast majority of people in industrialized countries and elsewhere sourced foods not through their own hunting and gathering, but from a global agro-industrial complex. Processed foods, not just bags of potato chips and cans of soda, but also baby formula and energy bars, are engineered to appeal to our ancient cravings for sugar, fat, and salt. Even fresh produce is the outcome of market-driven optimization, with fruit and vegetable varieties bred for appearance, transportability, and of course, taste. Misalignments in our food industry. Self-dealing actors can hijack evolutionary inclinations to their own advantage. And this is this, this folklore tale of the evil stepmother. The winner's curse and commodification of life. Can't we call out bad behaviors, regulate them, and shame them and make them go away? Maybe in an ideal world we would want a system that selects for the production of products, information, and services of maximum inherent value at the lowest cost. Kin altruism plus free market competition is a race to the top. Mm -hmm. Okay. So where we are today, a world in which people largely produce products, information, services that prioritize their external value, their trading or sales value over the inherent value. As we fall in rank from number one in our mom's life to number two in a stranger's life in so many of our life domains, it proves a phenomenon called commodification, which is the creation of things for their trading value. It's darn near impossible to keep extractive capitalism in check. The negative feedback loop that would keep violators in check is not strong enough to deter exploitative behaviors. Competition, if anything, selects for lowest costs, which will be associated with lower inherent value. The system selects for maximum commodification at the lowest cost, associated with the lowest inherent value. Students face increasing pressure to learn not for the inherent value of learning, but with a focus on the external value, the commodification of that effort in competing for college admission. Virtue is once pursued for its own stake. By contrast, Virtue signaling is the commodification of virtue. Cars were once bought for transportation. Now the signaling value of automobiles often exceeds the mechanical value. Clothes used to clothe the person. Now fashion is about signaling. People used to live life itself. Now they too often attend events or travel for the purpose of promoting their personal brand on social media. Language might once have been used predominantly to convey truth, but now it is far more often used to tell a story. The system self-selects for extractive and exploitative institutions. If we force one media company to use less clickbait, another will use more in order to pick up the other's market share. In a way, the Kardashians and high fructose corn syrup are really the same phenomenon, a race to the bottom line when misalignment meets unbridled capitalism. No matter how many times we rerun the simulation called society, the system will eventually select for fake news about fake heroes endorsing fake foods. Another interesting theory here, embed mom 
when conveying information. Don't be part of the code update. People who act with their best interest at heart have been increasingly replaced with people who act with their own best interest at heart. This change promotes the evolution of institutions towards prioritizing commodification, extraction, and exploitation over inherent value to the people. There is a lion behind that tree or don't drink that water. It was in the service of their tribe shared genetic interest to communicate those things. A culture of storytelling to convey information useful for survival. Today, communications, technologies, and social media enable genetic strangers to control most of our information flow. Their self-interest is to use information to exploit their audiences to maximize their own fitness. Oof, digital social gluttony is debilitating. It's what we're all going through right now with the massive use of social. The vast majority of information is actually noise masquerading as information intended to dupe the public in the service of extractive capitalism. With very few exceptions, the media today draws our attention to a seemingly endless parade of remote threats that are not in our immediate vicinity and therefore are mostly irrelevant to our evolutionary fitness. Like our food, the interactions encouraged by digital media are designed to be heavy on stimulation and low on nourishment. Processed information is as harmful to the mind as processed food is to the body. Damn. An endemic of digitally enabled social gluttony that is every bit as debilitating as the obesity epidemic. Digitally enabled social gluttony. Hmm. Should stop accessing our phones 150 times a day. Prehistoric males who did not instinctively respond to visual cues about potential mates would face adverse evolutionary selection. An organism that does not rubberneck at signs of carnage is ignoring useful cues about a threat in their vicinity which could lead to adverse selection. Today, the entertainment industry lures viewers with manufactured scenes involving sex and violence. The industry is incentivized to exploit our hardwired tendency to rubberneck at such cues. Our innate tendency to pay attention to status, our positions within the social pecking order, affect access to resources, mating opportunities, and many other elements of evolutionary success. Players often played their entire careers for a single team and were fixtures in the civic life of their town. This is sports now. That was entertainment. The country is wealthier, yet the sport has also priced out many casual fans from spending a season with the team. Due in large part, the increasing variety of entertainments are available. It is also partly related to people relocating around the country for various reasons. Free agency. Players also began to relocate around the country at dizzying rates. Since a player's identity is rarely tied to a town for more than a brief stint, fan adoration doesn't last much longer than a summer fling. Baseball attendance is near an all-time high, as are revenues, but ask 100 kids in San Francisco today to name the starting lineup of their local team. They probably could not name more than five players. That degree of apathy would have been unthinkable 50 years ago. Ritualized non-lethal competition is common among social species, and human social systems exhibit ritualized competitions that result in rank. Sorting rank through competition enables the development of dominance hierarchies that feed into secondary social behaviors, including rank-based mating, resource distribution, and cooperation. Getting very much deep into the biology, into our biology of our social primate tendencies. Hierarchies and mating, and status, all interplay into this conversation. A sense of collective affiliation in 19th century America began to develop towards teams and athletes based on what city one lived in and what university one attended. An increasing sense of alienation and decreasing sense of community due to the replacement of high 
align kin tribes with low aligned communities of genetic strangers, sporting leagues were more than happy to provide an emotional salve of affiliation, however fleeting. They desperately needed to find common ground somewhere, somehow, because we felt so distanced from our kin origins of human social evolution, so we found them in sports. A sense of soullessness is usually a good barometer of whether an institution has turned into a low alignment commodity. Youth sports. Arguably too much effort and attention to their children, again that revisiting theme, rather than anything that remotely resembles the neighborhood life. Is no different from the nepotism of imperial self-dealers. Cue the rug rat race among modern parents. The shared affiliation of youth sports fills the emotional void created by the destruction of the neighborhood sense of community. Families being drawn towards youth sports also draws them farther away from their physical neighbors, increasing the sense of neighborhood alienation that makes youth sports feel like an attractive alternative. Attending their kids' sporting events, including those that take them to remote locations, has become a pastime of parents to the exclusion of other social activities, including seeing one's spouse between Friday afternoon and Sunday evening. Such priority on our own nuclear family's children that we lose even our time with our spouse for it. And our neighbors. A lot of this is about filling these voids with these kin tribes that we don't have anymore. Filling it with entertainment, with sports. The inverse relationship is evident in places like Silicon Valley, which uses the word community liberally, but struggles to form strong ones. People wave at each other with five fingers in their immediate neighborhood with one finger during their commute <laughs> and with five fingers or like this i guess <laughs> and with five fingers when they entered the drop-off circle at their kids schools other status change industries humans are innately wired to attune to not only status but status changes such activities are the lure of games or sports Fun or saying particularly when it involves status elevation, also known as winning. Games are called great if there are many lead changes, status changes, and dramatic if a status change occurs against all odds in a late game. Some people are addicted to checking score updates for the favorite teams. Top 25 college football rankings have changed since the previous week. Top 40 song rankings were updated. American Idol occurs when a singer whom the audience has been led to believe is of lower status undergoes a status transformation while performing a single song. Downward status movement such as when a celebrity hits a rough patch also sells newspapers to a hungry public. The gossip industry is a status change industry. <clears throat> Gossip industry is a status change industry. Whew. The human mind seems voyeuristically drawn to undulating storylines of status change in books, plays, and movies. The mood changes and scenes of Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet can be described as alternating between low and high status. Street brawl intervention by the prince Romeo Mopes meets Juliet, learns she's a Capulet. Status change is considered a tool not only for drama or tragedy, but for improvisational comedy too. Status update. Facebook's many things to be but in ways a Facebook page is a signaling device for status. How many friends we have, who our friends are, what cool thing we did over the weekend were all our status attributes. Most powerful place in all social media today is a box near the top of Facebook page simply labeled as status update. What is that status update? What's on your mind? What's the status update? And social signaling. Oh, I'm high on the hierarchy. I travel a lot. I have great work. I look fantastic, etc. Mortgage lending. As housing bubbles form, mortgage lending drifts towards risky loans such as subprime lending at exactly the least opportune time. 
And too often lenders try to squeeze out the last of the profits of a boom period knowing they will only partially bear the consequences if their loans default. The bank executives pocketed the gains on the way up and on the way down the losses were disproportionately borne by shareholders, borrowers, and the public. Taxpayers too were playing the same game. Many of the losses were passed on to Freddie Mac, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, Fannie Mae, or other financial institutions that had to be bailed out by the government. In other words, the home buying public was partially able to socialize their losses. When the music stops, everyone passes the blame to someone else. No one ever admitted, I did it, not for a single buck of it. When people are able to capture the upside of an investment but socialize the losses, they tend to take excess risk in exchange for higher personal returns. Again, this is asymmetries, pocketing gains, socializing losses. Buying a house. There is a trade-off between getting the deal done and getting the deal done at the best price. Mm -hmm. Stampede of self-expanding beasts. Both examples of race to the bottom line incentive structures are hardly exhaustive. There's perversity of the US healthcare system, the Google opioid epidemic for an indication of the litany of misaligned incentives that plagues the industry. Notes in the secret of our success, all pro-social institutions collapse over time at the hands of self-interest. Damn. Stampede of self-expanding beasts. Here we go. Earlier we described how increased social entropy was the first order phenomenon that led to a second order phenomenon such as reduced alignment of interest and increased relationship liquidity. These issues contributed to third order phenomena, which we summarize as evolutionary maladaption of the social, political, and economic behaviors of institutions and individuals. The race to the bottom line was a fourth order phenomenon. Race to the middle. A possibility of revolt, including those which leads, which heads end up on the chopping block is evident to those in power. Thus, to some extent, the oppressors have a vested interest in putting the brakes on a runaway race to the bottom, not because they have a sense of justice, but to save their own necks. Even in this situation, the power of vested self-interest is at work. The Byzantine reflex. In medieval times, such protection might have taken the form of a castle topped with battlements and surrounded by a moat. This is an organization or institution that gains power, has a national center to protect that power in the status quo. Powerful incumbents have learned to use complexity as a barrier against competition. The Byzantine reflex refers to systems that are characterized by a tendency to self-evolve towards greater complexity and obfuscation in a way that favors the asymmetric beneficiaries of the status quo, AKA all of the old code that we live in. Self-expanding beasts. The product of the healthcare system is not healthcare, but old people who need more healthcare. Big food produces fake news about fake foods that increases demand for more fake food. The product of the media is ignorance and confusion, which creates a demand for more media. For the purposes of the book, any self-dealing institutions or system that was designed to serve the people but has mutated to serve itself by exploiting the people will hereby be referred to as a beast. Any institution that has self-engineered runaway feedback loops in its favor at the expense of the people will be referred to as a self-expanding beast. Ugh. So these beasts can engineer the social fabric in their favor too. They can stay in power. The more consumers feed on clickbait news and drink high fructose corn syrup flavored drinks, the more they empower the very companies that are exploiting them. The self-dealing media and food companies in turn get richer and are able to spend more dollars to bait consumers, forming a vicious cycle. In essence, these companies turn into self-expanding beasts that grow ever larger at the expense of the people. The fresh existentialists had partly right 
when they pointed out the alienation of modern man. Compared to our ancestors, we modern humans are systematically disconnected, alienated, if you will, from our neighbors, the natural world around us, our leaders, the food we eat, pretty much anything but our pets and the success of our children, both of which have become the subject of almost unbounded attention and investment. Our factory setting is biased towards exploiting strangers, reciprocal altruism, and trusting kin, kin altruism. Furthermore, reciprocal altruism has a flaw. It assumes that both sides have insight, in reality, information asymmetry, as well as hardwired preferences. Attraction to porn, violence, sugar, gossip can be mined. Moreover, the feed forward nature of the growth of the self expanding beast allows them to invest in better ways to increase and exploit asymmetries. All right, this is interesting. Solidarity and solitarity. Okay. Chapter seven. It's possible that humans are headed to become the 10th known example of a species in the animal kingdom evolving from a social system of solidarity to one of solitarity, one driven far more by individual self-interest than interpersonal interests. Hmm. It would take a very long time for the evolution of the biological code underlying human social systems to revert to one that is well adapted to solitarity. And nor is it evident that such shifts would prove beneficial in the long run. In the meantime, the lag error between modern cultural evolution and our biological factory settings produced millennia of dysfunction where individual self-interest trumps interpersonal interests as the operating system level of human society. As people feel betrayed by or alienated from others, they begin to self-deal. In so doing, they alienate others, further propagating the vicious cycle. In every case, that other is ourselves. In Kin Tribes of Yore, we balance taking personal responsibility with taking responsibility for each other. Following Hamilton's rule, our reptilian brain executes the default setting by taking less responsibility for those around us so we can focus more personal responsibility on ourselves. What results is a self-expanding cult of the self-movement. In such a system, the marketplace for psychology neologism selects its own self-expanding taxonomy. Words that once involved the second person are now used increasingly to describe first-person concepts. Advocacy used to mean speaking up for others, and schools now teach self-advocacy. Mindfulness used to be being mindful of others, but now it's a part of a self-help personal enrichment movement. We live in a world with self-service stations and take self-guided tours where we take selfies. Next time you go to a bookstore, marvel at how large the self-help section is and how much it has grown during your lifetime. Compare it to the size of the help others section at the bookstore. What help others section, you might well ask? Exactly. The word empathy is defined as the capacity to understand what another person is experiencing from within the frame of reference of another person. Even today, there is no word to denote the feeling of seeking empathy. These are the neologisms we need in psychology 2.0 so that we can build this interdependent capitalism, this global kin village. A new word for seeking empathy. There's going to be plenty more of these. If an empathizer is one who empathizes, what term describes the recipient of empathy? An empathy? What the empathizer intended to do with that piece of understanding says nothing about that when someone's empathizing. Will they use that information on behalf of the empathy or on behalf of their own self-interest? One outcome of the internet age is that many institutions know more about people than people know about themselves. They are data gathering machines masquerading as service industries. 
They use and sell that data to maximize their own economic gain at the expense of the people. Again, misaligned incentives in the tech and social media space. It's about that intention economy and the business plan and selling ads rather than actually leveraging these beautiful data on behalf of us to maximize what we want. One could make the case that the sum total of all the hero's journeys in the world has gotten us exactly to the point we occupy society today. What if our obsessions with being the hero, slaying the beast, and being transformed is a central contributor to our current dystopia? It's a big one. So maybe our hero's journey, obsession, created this dystopia. Hmm. Created the issues that we see. Chapter 8, Duality and Separatism. We are all both good and evil. It's not, I'm evil, you're good. I'm good, you're evil. We're both good and evil. And we have to start acknowledging that. But it's hard because the gray area doesn't sell in all of the entertainment. The black and white sells. It's easier. It's also cognitively easing. This global petri dish of misaligned incentives that is today modernity. All right. What about humans? Are we doggy dog people? Or we are good innocent people who bask in the illusion of domesticated bliss while displacing the evil onto a system that we disparage but nonetheless feed into and thus are a part of. Typically what we do, we say, I'm good, I'm good, I'm good. System's bad. No, we feed into it. It's a reflection of us. We're all responsible for it. Each of us is simultaneously the beast and the hero, the good and the evil, the problem and the solution. In separatism, we identify ourselves as the good people. We identify the opposing side as inherently bad people. Within a nuclear family, the human experience is characterized by unconditional love, service, and sacrifice. These behaviors are programmed and promoted by the 50% genetic vested interest that we ha they have in each other. While the husband and wife are not typically genetically related to one another, they share the reproductive bi bioprogramming and mutually vested genetic interest in their progeny that promotes love, service, fairness, and sacrifice. Over the generations, however, the shared genetic vested interest is diluted more quickly than you might realize. Grandchildren have one-fourth their genes in common, great-grandchildren only one-eighth. After 10 generations, the degree of genetic correlation among descendants is as low as 0 0.0009. In other words, they're genetic strangers. Assuming 20 years between generations, the original nuclear family spawns a network of strangers in a short 200 years. Boom. We all start with the original experience of our mother's unconditional love in utero and later experience the extractive behavior of strangers. We first become aware of light when we exit the tunnel of unconditional love. From that moment forward, we become increasingly aware of duality. That moment is worth a good cry. We can see each other's hypocrisies, but be blind to our own. In reality, we are all mixed parts of good and bad. Yet something has made us see the world in black and white made us believe that there are separate heroes and monsters. According to philosophy represented by the yin and yang symbol, all aspects of existence flows from this cycle of opposing forces, including flow itself. Independence and interdependence are the yin and yang of human coexistence. Neither extreme can stake a claim as the optimum modality for human socialty. A swing back to tribalism as a rejection of the hug of globalization, an embrace which is increasingly become, being performed with knives being held behind backs. So this is based on the yin and yang. We should be at the forefront of the rise of this counterforce. The countercultural swing back to tribalism would restore balance. Interesting. Rather than healing the wounds of alienation, today's tribalism throws salt in them. So. Where is this damn transformation we were promised? Where is the 
apotheosis. Haven't we gone on enough pilgrimages, attended enough burning mans, and disturbed enough Amazonians about their strange brews, a.k.a. ayahuasca, to find whatever it is we were seeking? How is that every time we set our compass for home, we find ourselves back in the wilderness? Seven billion people in the back seat want to know, are we there yet? We are all just a little bit tired. Can't we just 3D print the Holy Grail? We are. We're a little bit tired. Want that global kin village, inclusive stakeholding, and interdependent capitalism. But we need the code updates. This is the journey that we go through. The term Holy Grail has since become synonymous with an unattainable goal that is sought for its great significance. The answers are right in front of us. That's because, seen through a wider lens, the arc of human experience as we know it has been nothing more than an epic phenomenon of our search for something new to replace the inclusive fitness of the tribal era as the rhythm of our shared existence. It's doable. Finally, bring the inclusive ethos of the kin village to the global village. Thus, we have an opportunity before us, an obligation of epic proportions. We need this holy grail of code updates. We have the kin village with inclusive ethos, and we have the global village with self-dealing now has evolved. We need to bring the inclusive ethos to the global village. Part three, race to the top. Chapter 9, Revolution of the Social Contract. Written stories could outlive their storytellers and compete with descendant stories. Nicholas Copernicus transformed a convoluted geocentric model of planetary motion into the elegant heliocentric model that we have today. Nothing short of earth-shattering. This was in 1549 when Copernicus said that the earth is not the center of the universe. The earth simply orbits the star. Star does not orbit the Earth. And then the social con version of the Copernican Revolution could do to egocentrism what the astronomical version did to its anagramic cousin, geocentrism, make someone else the central star of our lives. Wow. Okay instead of ourselves, make someone else the center and central star of our lives. Passover suggests that trying to get people to understand that we might not be the center of the universe is non-trivial. Self-centrism has an innate appeal that other centrism can only envy. Hmm. Yes, tough. When defending an underdog position in a mimetic parallax, Galileo's fate exemplifies the perils of resistance against self-dealing, self-expanding beasts. These metaphorical beasts refer to socio-political economic institutions that self-expand through extractive capitalism, such as the healthcare system, big food, and fake news. Is there another way for an underdog to win without throwing stones, fighting through the resistance, and alienating or being alienated by the very opponent they are trying to persuade? It's very important because we can potentially make the code updates in a way that is peaceful. And so we'll get to that in a bit. The first order of business then is to create a system of inclusive stakeholding to replace inclusive fitness as the fundamental social contract of humanity. Shifting cultural norms, cultural reprogramming from egocentrism to interdependence through linguistic intervention, the creation and propagation of new words and cultural concepts. Cultural reprogramming through expanding the field of psychology from the current first person perspective to include second and third person perspectives. Cultural reprogramming through a channel of trust, packaging messages in music subverts the inherent neural reflex that detects whether the message is coming from someone familiar such as kin. This is interdependent stakeholding. So, okay, the linguistic inventions, these neologisms, and also packaging messages in music, okay? And apply the Aikido principle to power the tools rather than fighting against the forces that establish current conditions. In other words, we are optimistic that the existing forces driving the self culture can be redirected to a self-driving revolution against the culture of self-centeredness. In the ancient tradition of the Ouroboros, let the snake eat itself. So redirect the energy 
of the extractive and manipulative parts of the code. Redirect it to have it eat itself. So far good with the reprogramming and going through the book. Very interesting to be sharing this with you. Thank you again for tuning into it. Chapter 10, Independence and Interdependence. The Declaration of Independence was no doubt a monumental event, but how do we reconcile the celebration of independence with the reality that a quarter millennium later, Britain is now a close ally in the emerging global village? Does it make sense to keep throwing parades about signing divorce papers when we are in fact living together again? Indeed, all nations today are living together in a highly interconnected world. Our fates are intertwined as individuals and nations like never before. From ecological impact to interdigitated financial systems, we all have a collective interest in managing the risks and opportunities across the planet. Here are some fundamental questions. Are we going to use the connectivity to scale our localized self-dealing, extractive behaviors to the global level? Or are we going to use the Global connectivity to spread the very best of our human values. Whatever we do, the stakes have never been higher. Our mind's tendency to espouse separatism the way we did with separation of good and evil is the greatest existential threat to our future. On the other hand, embracing interdependence may be our most significant existential hope. Imagine a global holiday called Interdependence Day. Interdependence Day. Happy Interdependence Day across the world. That would be great. Let's start the movement to make that happen. Which day do we want that? What day should we pick and start the movement? Share it around the world. All right, chapter 11, Psychology 2.0. Here comes some of the neologisms. Understanding habits of the mind and how they can help shape behaviors. For starters, we need to get out of our own heads. The obsession with selfhood, solidarity's triumph over solidarity, the cultural reprogramming of our social contract begins with extending the field of psychology from the first person perspective to one that also includes second and third person perspectives. This is a very good table here. Check out. Okay, the zero sum game mentality of all witness. The former is a happy feeling caused by another's misfortune. Mm. Okay, I believe that's shot in fruit. And the latter is a sad feeling caused by another success. Envy. Freuden shot it. Meanwhile, compassion is the sadness we feel for the suffering of another person, compassion. What then is the term for a person experiencing happiness for the success of another person? Right here. What is that? Exactly. If you were to ask this a room containing 100 people, it would be a small miracle if one person called out the word compersion. A word for the feeling is elusive in other cultures. Customers have remained unnamed in many languages. Most Buddhists, for example, are, are unfamiliar with the word mudita which describes the Buddhist concept of vicarious joy. Compersion, such a beautiful word, posted about it today. Compersion, feeling joyful from another's experience of joy. How beautiful is that? We need to expand our neologisms. Compersion, compersion, parents' experience of their children, parents' experience of quiet and sometimes not so quiet joy when the child succeeds. This is encoded, this emotional response is a reward reflex to promote inclusive fitness. Compersion and compassion are the inherent psychological dynamics when there is high alignment. Imagine if we could promote the word compersion to that level of familiarity and high regard. That would make us happy. Let's get that word out. Share the word compersion with more people around the world. Have joy when someone else experiences joy. Go give them a hug, give them a high five, get excited about it. And share that with people. Share this word compersion. Build these neologisms for the Psychology 2.0 era. We know a lot about envy. We don't know how much about the psychology of wanting to be envied or wanting to be popular. We don't have word for that feeling. 
Similarly, no English word precisely captures the traits of seeking compassion, seeking to be understood, seeking validation, or seeking to be the object of curiosity. These are definitional phrases awaiting the invention of precise neologisms. Again, let's create those. System psychology, psychology 2.0 or inclusive psychology, remains hugely underdeveloped. We can kickstart inclusive psychology by starting to name the basic second and third person psychological phenomenon described above. Assigning neologisms to phenomena has a way of creating consciousness, so cultural shift is possible by creating a lexicon that makes us more conscious and mindful of the experience of others. Yeah. The definition of leadership is to steward the leadership potential of others. And this is what we write on our material, is simulation inspires you to build the future. We inspire you to build the future to update the code of our world. Here's an example. Think about the wor world issues and find a way to turn a they statement into an I statement. This can turn a depressing third person situation into a personal responsibility and action item. For example, California is not doing enough to keep the highways clean can be restated as I need to adopt my neighborhood highway so I can keep it clean. Boom. The reverse process is cool too when something good happens, turn an I statement into a you statement. I scored the game winning goal becomes your pass led to the game winning goal. In many ways that's how I feel about Ron. Is that Ron's assist with this, his co-creation with this, is why we're able to build simulation. These processes help us look for people to appreciate and we can begin to include others in our story. Words have the power to shape our culture and we have the power to create new words and create new uses of existing words that can help shift our psychological frame from individuality to interdependence. Speaking of leaders, in his inaugural address, President JFK, John F. Kennedy, beseeched his countrymen, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. It was thus in the throes of the Cold War and another conflict that was heating up that Kennedy launched the Peace Corps. Creating new vocabulary and cultural program through Psychology 2.0 is one thing. It's another thing to entirely drive their adoption. Unfamiliar concepts tend to elicit suspicion and skepticism. How do we break through such psychological barriers to adoption? Hello, music! Music. Chapter 12, Mother's Voice. Okay, 50 years ago, Jeremy's grandfather, Sung Hee Yoon, appeared on Walter Cronkite's national TV program due to his work of inserting public education into pop songs. Work that later landed him a career at the World Bank where he collaborated with musicians around the globe to create positive social change. So a proof we already know in our hearts that music can change the world. This is interesting with the Yoon family, the lineage has been happening for so long. With Jun Yoon's father and now Jun Yoon's son, Jeremy, the power of music to sp spread really important messages. This is a good challenge for, for us all. Create the neologisms with our Psychology 2.0. Create the new social fabric of inclusive stakeholding for the global kin village, as well as Create the music, write the lyrics to the music yourselves, play the instruments yourselves, make the new music. A song is among the oldest forms of communication in nature, older than human language and even older than humans. Music today feels commodified. Neuroscience has shown that people respond to the same message differently depending on the context, who said it, the tone of voice and so on. Making a request into the right ear got far more positive responses than making the same request in the left ear. Humor and music also allow an audience to engage with the message through different pathways in the brain than do words alone. Music is a particularly effective way to bypass mental defenses against messages. Familiar music activates the same neural, emotional, primal reward reflex as when a baby hears a mom's voice, a critical source of emotional comfort and social learning.
Fake news is old as biology. As mentioned earlier, the most important thing about a message is who gives it to you. Mom may not know best, but she cares about you most by virtue of Hamilton's rule. That's why evolution wired us to trust our mother's voice more than any other voice. Not because she has the best information, but because she cares about us on average more than anyone else does. As the saying goes, life doesn't come with a manual, it comes with a mom. The unconditional love of mom. Imagine programming that into our society at large. Songs once served as a unique acoustic fingerprint of a family member. Now they are industrially replicated to draw your affection and attention. Familiar music's ability to trigger the same neural reward reflex as hearing one's mother's voice can be used to reshape culture in a positive direction. Okay. People tend to sing along to songs they hear, which reinforces messages, and people like to sing together, which spreads messages. Think about that. It's a very powerful way of disseminating the music. People like to sing together. It is more resonant that way, more popular that way, spreads the messages that way. And keeping up with the Aikido principle, global connectivity, the very force that is challenging human values, can spread the very best of our human values through music. All right, interdependent capitalism. Man is born free, and everywhere he is in chains. It ought to be about the lack of mutual vested interest right now. This is the debate. If mutually vested interest is properly designed as the social contract in an independent interdependent network, man's innate tendency to pursue self-interest can be harnessed to work for mutual benefit rather than extraction. That is, social algorithms for inclusive stakeholding can be designed to mimic the bio-algorithms of inclusive fitness. Goal congruence increases with the degree of mutually vested interest. This is UBA, universal basic assets, things like this, the inclusive stakeholding. Can we tie the success of teachers to that or their pupils? Can we tie the success of health insurance, food, and media companies in every industry to that of their customers as well as the public interest? Can we tie the success of elected officials to that of their constituents? Can we find ways to include the environment, future generations, and others without a voice as stakeholders? Can we redesign physical and online communities around the right mix of diversity and common interest the way Kin Drives once did? This recent emergence of blockchain technology and other related technologies represents an unprecedented platform to instantiate this vision to create vested interest among interdependent stakeholders. Inclusively defined the way inclusive fitness differ kin tribes. It would be akin to taking the notion of employee stock options common stock options common in Silicon Valley companies and extending it to users, consumers, and other stakeholders. And we've talked about this on the show so much, is that it's not just the founders of the company that raise the capital from people that hire the employees that build the company, but it's all the people that buy and use the products that also deserve to be shareholders and stakeholders. What about where the company is headquartered? In the city that it's headquartered? Doesn't that community also deserve? Also part of the economic partaking in things? So how do we distribute um, the profit if the cost of something that you make is this much and then you're trying to profit this much how do we distribute those to be more fair? Versus if the cost of the product is this much and you only profit this much, maybe you don't need to distribute so much of it. So it's all these kinds of questions to look at. All right. We may not be able to count on personal agency to override people's hardwired tendency to self-deal. We believe the key will be in creating new social contracts that give people vested interest in the success of others. Boom. In other words, the diversity of competing interests like alignment of interests is a feature, not necessarily a bug of complex social systems. Bottom-up philosophy that each community, when properly incentivized to do so, is in the best position to create incentive structures that serve the greatest good. Launched an incentive prize. This is a big part of their initiative on inclusive stakeholding. Okay. They've launched an incentive prize for incentives to develop a new model called interdependent capitalism, aka interdependent stakeholding. Competition is a natural force of social system. We are leveraging this force to nurture the best ideas for social innovation on incentives. 
Monk Fister Fuller said, you never change things by fighting the existing reality. To change something, build a new model that makes the existing model obsolete. Whereas misalignment with competition is a race to the bottom, alignment with competition is a race to the top. Okay, again, remember, there's in the initiative on inclusive stakeholding launched an incentive prize for incentives to develop a new model called interdependent capitalism. So you can partake in this. Create your own models around interdependent capitalism so submit them to this incentive prize. It's a very good way to get involved and get your community involved, get your ideas out there. Chapter 14, Welcome Home. Evolution selected our innate social instincts, including altruistic behaviors to align with kin-based social systems. It probably was difficult for early humans to avoid living in kin tribes. The fitness value of kin-based living was too high, as was the cost of avoiding it. Indeed, higher order cognition that overrides innate instincts might even have interfered with fitness maximization. Human societies during the kin tribe era left us no record. Perhaps life for them just was. Somewhere along the way, we humans became seduced by knowledge, including the knowledge of how to harness energy and make tools. That knowledge uprooted humans from our kin tribes. Descendants battled and were banished to a life of wandering. Diaspora began. Feed forward accrual of knowledge and journeys. The dispersion and diaspora hit their planetary limits and the low aligned lineages merged and remixed. Civilizations began to rise and fall. The rising tide that has buoyed us materially has unmoored us spiritually. Way too many parts of the human experience feel soulless. It's time to restart at year zero. The purpose of this book is not to swing the pendulum of human endeavor from self-dealing to self-sacrifice. The truth of human nature lies more in the deep and enduring tension that exists between these extremes than in the extremes themselves. And that's how we speak so much about how the binary versus all of the great nuance and gray area. The truth of our human nature lies there. Our story is that our lives, all of our lives, are best served by encompassing some mix of both modes of living. In Lane's self-interest as a social code works best when we also have a vested interest in each other's lives. Most importantly, going forward, we have the opportunity to reinvent our institutions based on inclusive stakeholding, goal congruence, and vested interest in the success of others attributes that were inherent in the inclusive fitness of our prehistoric social systems. We are now stewarding each other's journeys homeward. Instead of a world in which history is written by the victors, imagine a world in which history is made by helping others win. History being made by helping others win. All right, in the epilogue, the tree of life is a mythological archetype that appears throughout the world's religious and philosophical traditions. A branching tree is also employed as a metaphor for evolutionary speciation, blockchain forks, and many other systems that feature ramifications. What is a branch point in a tree? Analogous to mimetic parallax, a branch point is where ramification and division occurs. In a tree, common central chunk bifurcates into separate limbs, which bifurcate into branches. The process repeats iteratively until the tips of the leaves fractal recursion is evident. Tree of life can also serve as a metaphor for the diaspora of a kin hive over generations. From a central shared trunk, kin lineage iteratively bifurcates in repeating patterns over time. The further downstream from the central trunk, the more distant the cousins. Leaf genome sequences on an individual tree were not found to be identical. They varied systematically on a gradient from the bottom to the top of the tree. Thus, the genetic variance among branches increases along with the degree of ramification. Each tree exhibits microchimerism. If the limbs of a tree are seen as a collection of conjoined cousins, when one cousin dies, the remaining branches not only survive, they thrive. A human cancer cell, then, is a division gone rogue. A cancer cell can subvert existing host pathways and hijack them to self-deal at the expense of the host. The cancer becomes a self-expanding beast that feeds on the host, a former community member that grows by feeding off the community. The parallels to institutions in our society today are self-evident. 
what institutions are cancerous. By some degree of competition, overall goal congruence, and vested interest in each other's success, the distal branches can be thought of as genetically different cousins who compete with each other for resources from the central trunk below. They grow upward and past each other competing for sunlight from above. And distal leaves are as benign as Little League Baseball. Enough competitive dynamic to help nurture the selection of beneficial traits among the distal leafy cousins, but not enough competition to truly hurt each other. One thing, one can think of competition for resources from the trunk as competition for mother's attention, and one can think of vertical competition for sunlight as competition for father's attention. But the competition is subordinate to their shared fate of interdependence. Shared fate of interdependence plus the competition, the collaborative competition. For everything to be one, there can be no end to the oneness. The concept of a unifying oneness can only exist as an inferential infinite loop. People aren't good or evil. Everyone is good and evil. The gift that drives transformation. The curse of human dualities. The conflicts between capitalism versus socialism is the gift that drives transformation. These dualities drive transformation. A circle is the essence of duality. The self-feeding beast turns out to be a self-consuming serpent that has nothing other than the circle of life itself. And thus the story begins. So that's the epilogue. And then within the related essays, there's a couple really important points here that I think we need to bring up, summarize things. Kin altruism to reciprocal altruism, to the global kin village. Kind of like the evolution airy steps that we've taken. So we've had a shift from predominantly based on kin altruism to one based on reciprocal altruism. During the kin tribe area, we could generally rely on others acting with our best interests at heart without performing an undue amount of due diligence. Counterparty risk is far higher among genetic strangers than genetic relatives. What if the shift from living in kin-based social systems to living in communities of strangers, which lowers genetic alignment and increases counterparty risk, was a forcing function in the acceleration of advanced symbolic systems such as language? Very interesting point. When genetic alignment is higher, the need to negotiate is lower. When alignment is low, interactions require a greater degree of negotiation. So the slow f um, fragmentation of our kin tribes uh, created a higher degree of need to negotiate, which could have led to the development of language, potentially. Compressive scales represent quantities according to relevance. When something is scarce, such as bananas in wintertime, being able to discriminate between the quantities one and two matters. On the other hand, there is no fitness relevance to being able to distinguish between high numbers such as 280 and 281 bananas. For example, spending $25,000 for a car versus $24,000 is a huge discrepancy for a customer with a net worth of $30,000. It is vital that the consumer senses the $1,000 difference. A linear scale enables this sensing far better than a compressive scale. The development of linear scales catalyzed trade among counterparties for reciprocal altruism. The invention of the small clay tokens, the oldest known human systems for counting around 4,000 BC, so about 6,000 years ago. Pictographs on tablets representing numerals, developed to facilitate transactions, commodities. Sumerians invented arithmetic, including addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division to manage their grain trade. Thereafter, more and more advanced mathematics began to emerge. Linear mathematics has proven its worth. High resolution at high numbers is the only way to create the kind of precision at high numbers that would allow us to land a rocket far away on the moon. Notice that everything in nature curves and all the straight lines you see are man-made. Black swans tend to get underpriced as a result. 
individuals experience the world based on the language they habitually use. Experience the world in a far richer fashion and develop advanced thoughts. So this is the, the development of elaborate languages helped us experience the world in a far richer fashion and develop advanced thoughts. A broader interpretation of the theory of linguistic relativity suggests that naming words promotes consciousness through awareness. By transitivity, those who espouse such a view could make the case that the transition of human social systems from inclusive fitness to reciprocal altruism may have been a forcing function for the emergence of human consciousness. Wow. From inclusive fitness to reciprocal altruism might have been a forcing function for the emergence of this more complex human consciousness, things, things like language, potentially. From an individual's life perspective, children have no subjective memory of the time before they could name things. Fractally, from the perspective of the species, humans have no recorded memory of the time before the emergence of symbolic systems. All right, very important section here, mimetic pa parallax and mob mentality. Binary divisions, either or choices, and various types of polarization aren't a bug of human social software, they're a feature. Think about it, what comes immediately after world peace? Civil war. Why? From a multi-level selection perspective, evolution selects for systems with features that increase evolutionary capacity. In perfect replication, sexual reproduction, predation, programmed death, mimetics, etc. And add to this list, mimetic parallax, which is the tendency of meme groups to diverge into competing views. So this is like parallax over consensus, but in a balanced way. The tendency toward groupthink, driven by mimetic algorithms, can trap systems in local minima in the adaptive landscape that impede evolutionary novelty and constrained fitness. Diversity and conflict within a system promotes system robustness and evolutionary capacity. Selection favors systems that generate feature parallax, diversity over consensus especially when it promotes conflict to a degree that optimizes competition and accelerates evolution. Darwinian arms race for features related to mobility, evasion, defense, perception, weapons, communication, social behaviors, and further evolutionary novelty. A second opinion from a trusted partner is a significant value add in partnerships, teams, and marriages. When facing a common external enemy, we tend to settle our internal disputes and unite against the enemy until a larger consensus peace results. Once the enemy is dissipated, mimetic parallax reemerges. The victors of World War II entered peace discussions with the spirit of international cooperation and exited with divergent agendas. But continued parallax and overfragmentation are also costly. The us versus them campaigns. Selection favors dynamic systems capable of both consensus, mimetics, and mimetic parallax in a context-dependent fashion. A fractal is apparent. The tendency for groupthink and the tendency for parallax. Peace will follow war and war will follow peace and so on. Hive mentality can be transformed into its dangerous alter ego, mob mentality. A delusional disorder in which individuals incorrectly believe they are infested with parasites, often compulsively gathering evidence to present to others. Witch hunts fall into this category too. Groupthink is an evolutionary win for both the individual and the superorganism. Rearing offspring, shared defense, resource acquisition, migration, and communication all work better in a kin-based group. Prehistoric times tribal beliefs we might call mimetic affiliation today, corporate culture, or patriotism. At that point, mom mentality of the superorganism can own the minds of the individuals who lose their capacity for intellectual honesty and the hallmark of someone under the spell of a dangerous mob. In many ways, some of the employees at some of the larger corporations potentially feel this way, and they need their ability to speak up. Some, sometimes they almost can't. We need to change that culture. The embedded growth obligations that these organizations need to change as well. Are they still serving society quite well? 
nuanced discourse around that. Groupthink and mob behavior are everywhere. They are a defining feature of life and subconsciously influence our everyday behavior far more than we realize. Seems some balance of competing interests and alignment of interests within social groups maximizes evolutionary fitness. It's a very important phrase there. What is that balance? Including weapons of mass destruction, nuclear weapons, and weapons of mass distortion, extractive media, diversity without common ground creates separatism. Separatism with mob mentality promotes polarization, polarization plus advanced weaponry leads to upheaval. Evolution did not anticipate an era in which mimetic superorganisms could form around memes that serve the interests of the superorganism itself, but not serve the interests of the individuals that comprise the organism. The superorganism. And related SA3, reimagining fairy tales. The institutions we built to attack the self expanding beasts in one area become the self expanding beasts of the next. Restoring the alignment of interests in our communities. Interdependent stakeholding through innovations such as blockchain and cultural reprogramming to promote self driving revolutions that will steward the world to a better place. Story memes are more efficient than genes in transferring traits horizontally within a generation and vertically across generations, even across great gaps of space and time. This is why we prioritize memetics, memetics, memetics. So important. Powerful story memes for that inclusive fitness. For example, the death of a parent is one of the most transformative moments in the evolutionary fitness of their offspring. As stories arborize through retelling, they mutate. The diverse versions of a particular story compete among themselves for audience attention. The loudest chick in the next gets the attention. That is, instead of telling a story but in the best interest of the listener, people started to tell stories to promote their own interests. I have a major issue with that. We need a story tell for promoting the global kin village, not for just self-dealing. Once kin genetic alignment is gone and the defenses are down, the co-evolution of story, storytellers, and story listeners selects for the high fructose corn syrup of stories and storytellers. Be wary of such self-dealing storytellers, their accomplices and their industries, entertainment, publishing, podcasts, media, speaker series, etc. That is, race to the bottom nature of misaligned systems induces ongoing mutations of stories towards commercial success rather than to service the community. The key features of courtly love are honor, sacrifice, chivalry, service, and valor, ideals that are viewed with skepticism, if not laugh out loud, derision in today's culture. In the ideal of courtly love, however, these sacrificial features are expressed unsarcastically and unconditionally. A hero instinct is deeply embedded in the male psyche and even encoded in male genes. Fundamental point is that in the ongoing drama of biological evolution, females do more than procreate. They choose. Females choose. A key female contribution to the evolutionary progress is trait selection through mate choice. Females choose mate choice. I'm trying to say this for so long too. Females hold enormous power. They not only help surface genetically wired instincts of valor and service in males, they can also actively help select those genetically encoded traits for the propagation of her lineage. Huge. Transparent to transcendence. Transcendence is something that ensues after recognizing that the world of phenomena is merely an expression of an underlying eternal source. First in the hero's journey template, the good and bad qualities are typically segregated in the characters. In the real world, everybody's a mix of good and bad. In folk tales, people are either good or bad. That is, the characters are painted as black or white instead of gray. There is an insidious reason why these features were selected. They maximize audience attention. The hero's journey is a self-help narrative that fits the mimetic priming induced by rising mutual alienation over the millennia. Damn. Our tendency to think about others through the lens of separatism, a thinking trained and reinforced by the black and white nature fairy tales is the foundation of us versus them thinking. Yep, that nuance, that gray area, everyone. 
Polarization through mimetic parallax is the ex existential threat of our time. Worse, the race to the bottom nature of the mimetic marketplace selects for the most polarizing versions of stories. We argue that this phenomenon of corrupted storytelling has been happening since we left the area of kin tribes. However, the phenomenon appears to be accelerating in the modern world. Self-dealing media, including those that used extractive algorithms, are, di are driving the world towards sectionalism, gender wars, race wars, political polarization, witch hunts, and every other type of extremism and mob attack. People are finally beginning to see it. We we're able to see the extremism and the separatism and the polarization when we really need to be able to have some cooperation with the competition that we have in the ideas, both at the same time. Stories once served kin tribes. Once we shifted to low alignment communities, storytellers' interests shifted to seeking secondary gain for themselves. Stories became commodified. In other words, the hero's journey is the high fructose corn syrup of stories. Damn, there's so much about hero's journey that's been propagated, but that's a pretty powerful statement. High fructose corn syrup of stories. Need that nuance, not just good and evil. To escape the seemingly endless game of institutional whack-a-mole in which we appear to be trapped. Duality is the reality. Each of us is simultaneously hero and the anti-hero. Imagine if the aim of our journey is to steward each other's journeys. We believe this is the fairy tale of the kin tribe era. We believe this was the original love story. This was also the original hero's journey. We are never just the hero or just the anti-hero. We are a hybrid of the two. Holding competing moral thoughts is not easy critical and that our hero's journeys are to steward each other's journeys our hero's journeys are to steward each other's journeys inspiring you to build the future you inspire us to build the future we work together this is very important we create the patronage culture that we help lift you up you help lift us up we keep doing that with each other around the world All right, final word. We say the word stick it to the man is an idiomatic expression of defiance against these forces of oppression, but the man is actually us. Nothing can be, oh, um, all that is, it's not, it's not meant to be a perfect expression of the counterculture to all that is oppressing people. Nothing can be. Burning Man nonetheless remains the most intriguing attempt to break the oligopoly that self-expanding beasts have on culture and the human experience. And you can actually, you know, June's has been to Burning Man the past 19 years. So, gonna have a bit about that here. Welcome home. Strange thing to say to someone you've just met. This is that Burning Man culture. And San Francisco incorporated itself in 1850 to accommodate this influx of unwashed entrepreneurs. Golders time. Stories from those early years suggest that it was a bit of a free-for-all, an eclectic random mix of adventurers from all walks of life trying to build a city from scratch in a short period of time. no contest. San Francisco spawned the computing revolution, the hippie revolution, the venture capital revolution, the gay revolution, the biotech revolution, the internet revolution, the revolutionary idea that young people can start companies, the social media revolution, and the blockchain revolution. All of these phenomena have gone global. That's why Silicon Valley is such an important place to come and be and visit and explore and understand. Burning Man is an example. If it hadn't been for a city cop telling Larry Harvey to take his Baker Beach fire hazard on the road, he never would have discovered Black Rock City. And that's the creating the experimental civilization. It is the basis of our faith that humans will eventually, at some distant time, solve everything, whatever that means. What will we do after we solve everything, including longevity, space travel, world peace, and interdependent stakeholding? We probably do then exactly what we had been doing until approximately 10,000 years ago, gather around the fire, tell stories, and dance. This is what we have done since the beginning of time and will do until the end of time. There's probably more nuance to that. 
Um, there's a lot that's going to happen in the designer virtual worlds and in the simulations we create and all that kind of stuff and digitizing consciousness, how, if we can do that, how it's going to happen, all that stuff. Nothing's impossible, but our imagination is, is unbounded. There's so much to explore. It's an enduring human story that stretches in both directions outside the current 20,000 year grand interlude, the only strange epoch in human history where we got caught up in the belly of the beast. Burning Man then is that rare glimpse into the timeless and accessible life outside of the grand interlude. Being in this otherworldly place called Burning Man will feel like being home. So, some more information about Jun Yoon, Jeremy Yoon, and Conrad Yoon. And here's the back of the cover too, which you can check out. Again, that's the blurb we read at the beginning. And then this is June, Jeremy, June's here, Jeremy's here, Conrad's here. And again, the book is Interdependent Capitalism. Such fantastic book, again, by the Yoon Family Foundation, June, Jeremy, and Conrad Yoon. Again, this beautiful yin and yang with the tree, the leaves, as well as the roots, and redesigning the social contract through inclusive stakeholding. All right. Huge thank you everyone for tuning into this episode. Greatly appreciate it. It's been a long one. We've been doing a book review of interdependent capitalism. We would love to hear your thoughts in the comments below on this book review and about inter interdependent capitalism. We would also love for you to check out the links below to the interdependentcapitalism.com, the Amazon book link, Palo Alto Institute, Dr. Junian's website, all of those links below. Have more conversations with your friends, your coworkers, people online on social media about your family, about interdependent capitalism, about the new inclusive fitness at, on the global village level, and about building the technologies that we need to get there, about building out the blockchain technologies, about building out the music technologies. Maybe it's you that's gonna be singing, or you that's playing the instrument, or you that's gonna be doing the psychology 2.0 neologisms. We need all of these different pieces to the puzzle. We need to figure out how to work better with our social, economic, and political fabric, with our corporations and our governments to get rid of fake news, fake food, and fake politicians, and bring in the, the right incentive structures that propagate a global cohesive stakeholding interdependent fabric. So let's get talking more about that, everyone. Let me know what you thought about this book review and what you think about book reviews in general, how you'd like me to handle them in the future. Would love to hear from you about that. And this is all up to us, everyone. Support organizations like Simulation. If you believe in what we do, all of our links are below. Help support us scale and grow an impact. Build the future, everyone. Manifest these dreams into the world. We got this collectively together. We can do this. Huge shout out to June Yoon and the Yoon Family Foundation. Love you all. You're huge mentors of mine. This is one of the best books I've ever read. Everyone, check it out. Huge thank you, and we'll see you soon. Much love. Peace.